Hi, good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to today's CPAN, uh, which we should be starting shortly. Um, the announcements are on the screen. They've actually been scrolling for about 15 minutes. Uh, next month, or yes, next month's CPAN will be Gender Identity Development in Children and Adolescents. That will be October the 6th at noon. Uh, and if you've not had the opportunity to enroll in Texas CPAN, you can do that by using the QR code or you can actually call that number that is on the screen. Actually waiting, I think. Um, waiting for Elizabeth. She should get here, but I'll go ahead and do the introductions for today. Um, we've got three speakers, Stephanie Simmons, Hallie Ross Young, and Elizabeth Hooker. Stephanie is the program director, assistant professor, clinical psychology and psychology internship and fellowship. She's a licensed psychologist with a focus on child abuse and trauma. She grew up in North Carolina and attended the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for her undergraduate. Stephanie graduated from Baylor University with her doctorate of psychology in 2018 after completing rotations in early childhood abuse assessment and community mental health. Stephanie completed her postdoctoral fellowship in pediatric psychology at Texas Scottish Rite Hospital for Children and then moved to Tyler to begin work with the TASC program. Our next speaker, I'm not sure, it's a panel, so I'm not sure which order they're going in. Uh, Hallie Ross Young, she's presently serving as Assistant Professor of Clinical Psychology, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine on the UT Health Northeast campus, where she is the direct clinical supervisor to interns postdoctoral fellows, psychiatry and family medicine residents. She is a licensed psychologist completing her master's of science in clinical psychology and her doctorate of clinical psychology, both at Baylor University. And Elizabeth Hooker, she's a native of Louisiana, having completed her undergraduate and graduate education in counseling at Louisiana Tech University. Prior to moving to Texas, she spent time working with clients in the drug court system. Since her arrival in Texas, she has worked as a crisis counselor, providing therapy services for child and adult survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. She earned her graduate certification in dynamics of domestic and family violence and is recognized as a nationally certified counselor by the National Board of Certified Counselors. So with that, we can get started as soon as they are ready. All right, thank you, Meredith. Um, I am gonna go ahead and share the PowerPoint if that works. So thank you everybody for being here today. Um, okay, can everybody see that? Thumbs up, thumbs down. OK, cool. Um, so I, you know, I appreciate everyone who is here and you know, hope that you were able to get a good bit of knowledge and um, some good information from the panel that we did on September 1st. Um, and so what we really wanted to do today is kind of follow up on that and take you know, some of that knowledge and some of that information and try to apply it in practice. So our objectives for today um, are, you know, we really want to give you some hands on examples of um, ineffective ways to screen for suicidal ideation in a primary care setting, um, ways to implement an effective risk management strategy. Um, we would like to demonstrate collaborative safety planning with children and caregivers um, and also help you identify um, the elements of an effective crisis protocol for your individual clinic. Um, so we have kind of a variety of things that we're going to be doing today, so we can go ahead and jump in. 
Um, so to start out, I wanted to quickly kind of review some myths and facts that um, we talked about in some of the previous panels and Dr. Kerr's previous presentation. Um, so as we read through these, feel free to type in the chat box if you think this is true or false, myth or a fact. Um, so our first one is asking about suicide makes a patient more likely to think about it or to follow through on a plan. Do we think that's true, false, myth, fact? Any thoughts? Myth, okay, I have one myth, that's a good start. Awesome, yes, so false, myth, absolutely. Um, so it, there is no evidence to suggest that asking directly about suicide, suicidal ideation, or thoughts of self-harm um, in any way correlates to um, a higher likelihood of any of those outcomes actually happening. Um, and it's actually been shown that directly asking about it and being able to deal with it um, actually makes a patient um, be able to safety plan better and be less likely to follow through um, with any self-harm. So number two, parents will not approve of a provider asking their child about suicidal ideation. So parents may get mad or think that it's inappropriate. We think that's true, false. Maybe it depends. False. Yeah, false. Great. Yeah, so um, most parents, you know, I can't speak for all parents because we all know that there are outliers, um, but most parents are not going to be upset or be angry um, for a provider for asking their child about safety. So number three, it's important to directly ask about suicidal ideation. So, you know, asking very directly rather than kind of dancing around the question or trying to sugarcoat it. True, I like the true in all caps. <laughs> I appreciate the enthusiasm fact. Yes, absolutely. Um, it is very, very important for us to be very clear with our language to be sure that we're asking and getting the answers that we need to these questions. So asking, you know, have you ever had any thoughts about hurting yourself versus asking, are you thinking about killing yourself? Those are two really different questions and we need to be sure that we're using our precise language. Hi, great job, y'all are on top of this. Um, so number four, um, there is no difference between saying committed suicide and died by suicide. I think that's true, false. Does language matter here? False. Perfect. You guys are on a roll. So yes, that's, again, this is another great example of why language matters. Um, so, you know, we really want to be using inclusive language and respectful language um, when we are talking about suicide and suicidal ideation. Okay. Um, number five, hopefully this is an easy one. Um, children don't experience suicidal ideation. Hopefully this is kind of a, a freebie. False, oh, yes. So this is absolutely false. Um, we know that children of any age and very young children even can experience and do experience suicidal ideation. Um, and even children at a very young age will actually follow through on that suicidal ideation. Um, so this is something that we need to be considering and asking about with all of our patients, not just adolescents or adults. Okay, so final myth or fact, um, number six, when children and adolescents express suicidal ideation, it's usually or typically for attention. So, you know, they don't really mean it, they're just saying it to get attention. Okay. Oh, lots of falses, great. Yes, yeah, so this, this is definitely not true. Um, typically when patients are expressing suicidal ideation, that is a legitimate need, cry for help, um, and something that should be taken very seriously, not brushed off as just attention seeking. So, excellent job, you guys are six for six on our myths and facts. Okay, so what we're going to move into now is um, our team. Um, oh goodness, sorry, I'm trying to admit everybody. Um, did a wonderful job and put together um, some role plays so that we could actually demonstrate what some of this looks like um, in a clinical setting. Um, now I just need to figure out how to actually play it. Here we go. Okay. 
So before I start this, um, the first few videos that you're going to see um, are very much related to um, what not to do. So as you're watching these, think about um, what our provider could have done better. And then after the video, Elizabeth is going to have a couple of questions for us to discuss as a group. If I can get this working. All right, Elizabeth, I will let you take over. Okay. Um, so I am able to see it, so I just want to make sure everybody was able to see it and just drop in the comments if you were able to see it. Um, you're breaking up. You're kind of, you're kind of uh, yeah, choppy. Okay, what about now? Now you're good. OK, sorry about that. Technical difficulties on my end. Um, so what are some of the issues that you noticed in this video? And I want you to look at not only what I was saying, but also my body language, my tone of voice and the reactions of my reactions versus the patient's reactions. Anybody can either unmute themselves, talk about it or leave um, something in the comments. Yeah, so we have a couple comments. One saying looking down, not making eye contact eye contact with the patient, tone, looking at her watch. I'm very glad that you guys noticed, multiple people noticed um, that the provider great. checked her watch. No follow-up questions. Oh, and you couldn't see the video. I'm so sorry. We're gonna, we'll try that again on the next one. I see another comment that the provider did not seem confident in the recommendations, did not seem like she took the patient seriously. All excellent observation. Very good. And thank you guys for, for participating. I'm not able to see the video. So um, Stephanie, when you're done, or Dr. Simmons, when you're done um, playing it, will you let me know? I'm having some technical difficulties, I apologize. I apologize for those of you who can't see it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what exactly is going on. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and we'll try another one. Hopefully, um, hopefully this one will work a little bit better. I'm trying to think.
Okay, so we're going to try something a little bit different for the next video. Um, but for those, let's go ahead and kind of touch base on the, for those of you who could see the video. And then for the next one, we're going to try something different to see if we can be sure that everybody can see and hear. So for those of you who were able to see it, any thoughts? Yes, so, um, uh, yes, it's a very good observation that, you know, this, the provider wasn't taking her seriously, you know, was asking, are you sure? Your attention seeking doesn't really sound like something I can help you with. Great observations. And I would like to point out that these are things that clients have come to me and said that their providers have said to them. So just kind of let that sink in that, you know, providers are saying this to people. We are going to, like I said, try something a little bit different for the next one. All right. OK, can anybody see this one? So. I can see it and I wasn't able to see them before, so hope you brought you in today. Let's try. Um, I just I haven't been feeling very good lately. Uh, my boyfriend broke up with me and I just haven't been feeling myself. Okay, when you say you're not feeling yourself, is it, do you, are you having any body pains or anything like that? I've mean, just been feeling sad and tearful and I just don't feel like doing anything. Okay, so I'm going to stop you right there. Um, it sounds like this is a mental health concern and Frankly, I don't deal with mental health stuff. That's just, that's not my area of expertise. So I'm gonna maybe need to go seek a therapist. Okay. Okay. Is there anything else that's, no? Okay, thank you. Okay. Any comments about that one? So again, that was an example of one of my clients that that's what happened to her and that's how she became into my care is the doctor just was like, nope, I don't deal with that. That is not my area of expertise. You need to go see a therapist and ended the the um, the appointment right there. Like he got up and left. So that was, you know, traumatizing to my patient because again, she was trying to reach out and say, hey, something's wrong. Um, this was with a sexual assault that had happened. And um, so she, she mistrusts her doctor entirely. Some other great observations, you know, that it, there, it lacked empathy, it shut the patient down. Um, the provider didn't even, didn't even try to get the information and see really what was needed. Um, yeah, uh, that was a great observation. She could have been suicidal. Well, the provider didn't even ask about that. Um, and so they, you know, that provider never would have known if there needed to be a safety plan in place or if there needed to be additional actions taken. Yeah. And how do we think that the patient felt or Elizabeth, from your experience, you know, how did the patient feel after the like this type of interaction with the provider? Well, when role playing, I could tell she was she was very uncomfortable with it. Um, and then as uh, my patient who I based this off of, she was so defeated. She didn't trust her doctor anymore. She um, wanted to get a new uh, PCP and um, it did prompt her to seek out therapy, which was a good thing. I was able to help her in um, what was going on at the time. But just that mistrust in, you know, the medical field in general was just it, that was something that um, took time to rebuild that trust for my patient. Absolutely. And that's, you know, especially for individuals in primary care, 
um, you know, that's usually kind of that's a typical access point. And so to lose that and to lose the trust of that provider um, can be detrimental to a client. Okay. So we've seen a lot of examples of what not to do. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, for playing our uh, not empathetic provider. Um, and so our next video, um, we kind of wanted a redo. Um, so we're gonna take a few minutes to see how um, asking screening for depression and screening for suicidal ideation um, may look different in primary care. So give me just a second to switch. All right. I'm having a hard time hearing the volume on this one. Okay. That's strange. No sounds. Oh, hang on. I know what I did. Sorry about that, y'all. Hi, Betty. Thanks for coming in. How's your uh, last week been? Uh, it's been okay. It's been okay. What's been, what's been going on this last week? Um, well, about a month ago, my boyfriend broke up with me, and mm. things have been kind of hard since that. Mm. When you say kind of hard, what does that look like for you? I just, I've been feeling really sad lately. Um, I haven't really been wanting to do much. Okay. Um, I haven't really been doing well in school because of it, because my mind's kind of just been distracted. Um, and so my parents are kind of getting mad at me because I'm not bringing home good grades and they're starting to fight. Mm -hmm. So it's just been a lot. It's been a really tough time for you. Mm -hmm. During this past month when you've been feeling sad and down and struggling in school, have you had any thoughts about wanting to hurt yourself? Um, kind of, yes. Kind of? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about what those thoughts have been like when they've happened? Um, sometimes I just feel like maybe it'd be better if I wasn't here. Mm, okay. And how often in the last month have you had that thought? Mm -hmm, maybe like four or five times a week. Four or five times a week. Okay, so pretty frequently it sounds like. When you have those thoughts on a scale from zero, you know, they're not very strong at all to 10, like they're the strongest they could possibly be. How strong or distressing are those thoughts for you? I mean, sometimes they could be like a nine or a 10. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think this week it's been like a four, five. Okay. Mm -hmm. So those times when they're really up around a nine or a 10, have you had any thoughts or ideas about how you would hurt yourself? Mm, not really, but when I think about it, maybe I took a lot of pills. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. and, and do you have medications in your home that you could access? Um, my mom has a medicine cabinet. Okay. Mom has a medicine cabinet. Mm -hmm. And have you talked with mom about any of these thoughts that you've been having? No. I don't think she would understand. Okay. When you've had them in this last month, you know, and you've even thought maybe about these pills, have you tried anything to take your mind off them or help you feel better? Not really. I just kind of sit there, think about it, and it kind of makes it worse. Okay. So it's been pretty hard for you to get your mind off of that. Yeah. And it, it sounds like they might be scaring you a little bit. A little bit, yeah. A little bit, okay. Right. So how is this um, second um, attempt at a risk assessment different from the first couple of tries that we saw? What was different about it? You can put it in the chat, you can chime in verbally, whatever is easiest for people. Okay. So I see some comments, tone of voice was more engaging. There were specific questions on plan and intent. There was some more validation open-ended questions, follow-up questions that felt more compassionate. Okay, excellent. How do you think um, a patient, um, you know, our um, role-playing patient there may have uh, felt and may have experienced this second interview? Okay, I see also a 
comment seems less judgmental. Patient might feel more heard, yes. So we're actually taking the time to really ask about her experiences and let her feel more heard and validated, more cared for, excellent. And I don't know if anyone was kind of watching the timestamp, but how long did it take for the provider in this role play to demonstrate that level of empathy and concern and ask a few more follow-up questions? Did it take significantly longer? Took more time. Mm -hmm. Still less than five minutes, a little over a couple of minutes. Yes, exactly. So one of the things that we really want to demonstrate in these videos is how these risk assessment and safety planning skills can be done in a primary care setting and be done efficiently and really take a few minutes. Dr. Simmons just shared in the chat, two minutes and 37 seconds to be exact. Um, and so it, it was half of five minutes really. Um, and so even just spending those two and a half minutes to ask some more follow-up questions to validate your patient and to really see what their experience has been like for them can help them feel heard, can help them feel more comfortable opening up to you and talking about some of these experiences that they've been having. So I believe our next video that we're going to transition into now is let's say your patient has, you know, come to you and expressed these thoughts of suicide and, you know, perhaps this plan of overdosing. What can we do about it in a primary care setting? So we're actually going to watch a video um, where a provider is going to be doing a collaborative safety plan with um, our patient. Well, Betty, you know, I actually have something that you and I can talk about uh, called a safety plan. And it's something that we would work on together, but you could keep when you go home so that when you notice these thoughts coming up or when you notice that you're feeling really down and sad, you can look at your plan and you can use it for some ideas to help you feel better and stay safe. Okay. Does that sound like something that you'd like us to work on today? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to hand this to you. I've got a pen here for you to use. And if you'd like, you can write your name right there. This is your safety plan. You get to keep it. Fabulous. Today's date. Excellent. All right, so let's start with warning signs. What are some of those thoughts, feelings, or behaviors that you notice really coming up just before you start to think about hurting yourself? Or... Um, I think <clears throat> I start feeling bad for myself, and I wonder, like, why my boyfriend broke up with me. Mm. So. Maybe like I'm not lovable or I'm ugly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So having thoughts that you aren't lovable or that you're ugly, that sounds like a well, an important warning sign okay. to write down. Excellent. All right. So step two of your plan, these are things that you can do by yourself so that don't involve someone else to help you feel better or take your mind off of these thoughts when they come up. Is there anything that you've tried in the past that's been helpful here? Mm, not really. I've kind of just been sitting there and thinking about things. Yeah, you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. It was kind of hard to get your mind off of it. I wonder what sorts of things you normally like to do or mm. that are enjoyable to you. Um, I used to like to listen to music a lot. Listening to music. Mm -hmm. Is there any music that you know you really like to listen to when you're feeling sad or down that usually helps you feel better? Um, Pop music. Pop music. Do you have a favorite artist or playlist that you want to try listening to? Um, like maybe Beyonce. Okay, <laughs> listen to Beyonce. Okay, that excellent. Fabulous. So our next step in our plan here are people that we can talk to to take our mind off things. These aren't people that we necessarily have to say, you know, I'm feeling badly about myself or I'm thinking about hurting myself. Just people who make us laugh or cheer us up. Could they be like my friends? They could be. They could be your friends. Okay. Do you have a friend that, you know, you can talk to about these things? Um, my friend Sally is really good to talk to. Sally, okay. Mm -hmm. She kind of makes you laugh. You enjoy talking with her. Mm -hmm. She's pretty distracting. Yeah. Okay. So we can put her name down there. Okay. And that sounds like relationship is? Friend. Friend. Excellent. And do you know her number off the top of your head? Uh, yes. Wow. I, I, tell her, 
I call her every day, so I memorized her phone number. Wow, excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she's someone that you really could talk yes. to to take your mind off things. I love to hear that. Now, this next section, these are people that we can ask for help. So people that we would trust to say, I'm feeling really down. Could you talk to me? Could you, you know, help me? Could you help me get to the doctor? And I'd like us to try to have at least one or two adults in this section. Okay. Um, I don't really feel like I can talk to my mom right now. Okay. Do you have another safe adult in your life that you think you could talk with about these things? Mm -hmm. My grandma. Your grandma. Excellent. What do you call your grandma? Uh, Mima. Mima. All right. Let's put Mima down. Do you know her phone number? I don't time? know her phone number by heart, but I can put it in after. Yep, you can look at your phone and mm -hmm. you can always put it in afterwards. So this next section, this is ways that those supportive people can help you stay safe. Okay. And I know that you mentioned Mima is mm -hmm. on there, someone that you can talk to. Uh, how can Mima help you stay safe if you notice these thoughts of hurting yourself popping back up? Uh, so would that be like taking me somewhere? It might be taking you somewhere, and it might be um, helping you talk to one of your parents, okay. or helping you stay safe with maybe some things in your home. Okay. Um, maybe she could help me talk to my mom. Okay. Yeah. You would trust me, Ma, to help you talk to your yeah. mom. Yeah. Awesome. You can write that down right there. Fabulous. And then six. These are resources that you can call. I put a couple on here already and you can also add in more. But I want to point out, I have the National Suicide Prevention Hotline on here. It's free. It's available 24-7. They also have a text line. So that's a pretty cool resource. If you start to notice these thoughts coming up, you can always reach out to them. And, you know, depending on the time, the number of people calling, there might be a bit of a wait. Mm -hmm. But someone will be available to mm -hmm. speak to you. I listen to you and provide support. I also have on here the Trevor Project hotline. Uh, that's for people who identify as LGBTQ plus or part of that community. And you know that if that's you or if that's someone that you care about, this is a great number to have um, because you know if you call, you'll be talking with someone who's a part of that community or who's an ally. Okay. And then I also have on here the National Runaway Safe Line. So if you're feeling unsafe at home, this is also free and available 24-7 you can give them a call and they can help you make a plan to keep you safe. Okay. And do any of these numbers sound like something that you feel comfortable calling or texting mm -hmm. if you really need to? Mm -hmm. Which ones in particular? Um, I think the suicide prevention hotline. Awesome. Do that. If you'd like, you can put maybe a star by it or something and you can remember to save it in your phone Okay. so that you can use it when you need it. Excellent. And then this right here, this section is strengths that you have that you really want to remind yourself of that can help you overcome some of these warning signs and mm -hmm. I feel better to remember. I think that I'm nice. You're nice, mm -hmm. okay. Can I put that? I think you can. Sounds like you're very nice to other people and maybe even working on being nicer to yourself. Okay. Could be a strength we could work on. Fabulous. So the way that this plan is going to work, you're going to keep it with you, and if it's all right with you, we're going to invite mom in a little bit and maybe talk a little bit about some of these things on here. Okay. okay. When you notice these warning signs first getting started, I want you to start using the steps on your plan so that those thoughts don't build up to that strength of a 9 or a 10. Okay. So the first thing you'll do is try your coping skills by yourself. If you start to feel better, awesome, you can stop there. But if you need to go further down your plan, you can reach out to people for distractions or places for distractions. And you can also reach out to people for help, like your MEMA or those other trusted adults you identify. And you can remember uh, ways to make your environment safe. If it gets to the point where none of those things have helped as much as you would like or need, then you can reach out to these crisis lines or go into the nearest urgent care or emergency room and let someone know what you're experiencing. Okay. And throughout all of these steps, I want you to be reminding yourself about these awesome strengths that you have to help you get by. What do you think about that? I like it. I like how it steps. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there any questions that you have about anything on this plan or how you might use it? Mm, no, I don't have any questions. Anything that might get in the way of you being able to use it? Um, 
maybe if I don't feel like I want to talk to anybody. Mm, okay. So if you feel like you don't want to talk to anybody, how can we still make sure that this plan is going to be helpful for you? Mm, maybe I could just call this phone number if I don't want to talk to someone in that my you life. Know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's a great resource too, right? You, you don't know these people. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So you could go straight here if you needed to. Mm -hmm. I love that idea. Where do you think you'll keep it so you'll remember to use it? Um, in my nightstand. In your nightstand. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, something that I recommend, and you can try if you like it, is taking a picture of it on your phone too. And that way you have that copy in your nightstand and you also have the version that goes around everywhere with you on your phone if you need it. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. All right, everyone. Um, so what did you think about that safety planning intervention? Uh, once again, I don't know if anyone was watching the time stamp, um, but this was something that didn't take um, an extremely long amount of time. Very thorough. Okay. Um, Dr. Simmons, do you have an exact uh, estimate of the t amount of time that it took to safety plan thoroughly with this patient? Um, just under nine minutes just under nine minutes. So something that we could do relatively briefly um, with a patient and still, um, as you mentioned, Valerie, very thorough. Uh, what else did you notice about this safety planning intervention with uh, our patient? Any other thoughts, feedback or other ideas? Yes, we are eliciting patient input. So this is their safety plan. And throughout the process, we really want to be checking in with them to see if it's something that's reasonable, if it's something that they like. It was very systematic. Yes, excellent. Um, and, you know, we have the template that I used here on a slide. We're going to talk about each of these steps just a little bit more in depth so that each of you can feel equipped um, including, yes, the um, questions Tyler, at the end. We want to make get sure. A snack. Come on. We want to make sure that um, everyone is, uh, you know, involved, that they don't have questions about it, that they feel comfortable using it, they know where they're going to keep it. Because if we're making a safety plan and the person doesn't really know how or when to use it, it's not going to be effective. Um, and the cell phone picture thing, people people love that. So <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. This is what the safety plan template looks like. There are different varieties that you may use, but they all kind of have the same core components. And so that's what we're going to talk about um, today. So um, next slide, perfect. So warning signs, uh, I briefly mentioned with our patient, these can be thoughts that they have, um, like thinking I'm ugly. These can be feelings like sadness or anger or hopelessness. They can also be behavior changes that people notice, right? Things like I stop showering or I want to stay in bed all day or I just cry a lot more, different things like that. Or I yell at people, I get irritated more easily. Um, also be specific situations where they tend to notice these things, right? Maybe conflict with a parent or a partner or something like that. When we're talking about warning signs, we want to be as clear as possible, and we really want to emphasize to the patient to catch them early. Um, our patient mentioned she kind of sat and ruminated on them and it made things worse. So how can we know kind of what these warning signs are and what they look like when they're still um, in the less serious, less severe stages? The second step of uh, safety planning is coping skills that the person can use independently. Now, based on the age of the patient that you're working with, we had an adolescent here, um, she is able to do a few more things independently. So that's going to be something that you're going to have to consider based on the age of the patient you're working with. Um, and we also want these coping skills to be things that are healthy both, both in the short and long term. Um, so if someone even says things, and, and this is a common recommendation, like snapping a rubber band, um, doing that over a prolonged period of time can actually, it can still damage skin. And so we might recommend um, and work with the patient around coming up with an alternative that can be healthier, both in the short and the long term. Um, and it may require us to provide some ideas. If the patient is really stuck, uh, like our patient in this video, she didn't, hadn't really tried anything, didn't know what would work. 
Uh, so sometimes we can ask, well, what are things that you have enjoyed previously or that you have found helpful when you've been feeling sad? Um, she was able to identify listening to Beyonce. Amazing. Um, but if she hadn't, we might want to think of have some ideas at the right to toss out and say, you know, what about listening to music or taking a walk or some of these things? Would you be willing and able to try those techniques? Next slide, please. Um, and then we have ways to engage in distraction coping. So there's kind of two segments of social supports. There's the people who take our mind off our problems or improve mood, not necessarily the people that we, you know, tell that we're feeling depressed or experiencing suicidal ideation. Often people may list friends or even various like relatives or things like that. You know, someone they can go see a movie with or just chat to. And we also want to think of safe, realistic places the patient can go. Uh, so once again, this is based on age of the patient. If they aren't driving, um, this is really going to be something that we'll have to emphasize with a parent or guardian about, you know, taking the child to a place outside of the home. Or maybe the child can identify a safe place inside the home or the yard or something like that where they could walk. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with patients who are like, the beach is a relaxing place for me. Certainly, yes. Unfortunately, here in Tyler, Texas, we often aren't uh, very realistically close to a beach. And so we want to kind of talk about that with a patient and say, OK, that sounds like a great idea, but it takes a lot of time. It costs gas money. Is there anything that's a little more accessible and realistic um, and really working with the patient around uh, brainstorming some of those ideas? It could even be something as simple. I've had patients say I like to go to Walmart and people watch because it takes my mind off things. It could be something as simple as that. So we, we really do want to be open to possibilities. And then for social supports, these are people that we can disclose to and say, I am feeling down or depressed. You know, I need someone to talk to or someone to come and spend time with me. I can't be alone right now. Or I'm thinking of hurting myself. Can you help me, you know, get to a doctor or call someone or just stay with me for a little bit? Um, and so because this, area really is a, a heightened responsibility. We do recommend that at least one of these social supports be an adult. Um, there is flexibility depending on the situation. If the child really does not feel comfortable um, making a particular parent or guardian a part of the safety plan, if there is another relative like Mima in our role play who could kind of help with that conversation between our teen and our parent. Um, if there's a school counselor, if you know there's a pastor or a teacher or another, you know, relative, that could be someone. Um, we do want to let the teen or child know that we're going to implement. You know, we're going to kind of bring the parent in once again based on or the guardian in based on um, the patient and the context in which you're working. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then we really want to talk about ways to make an environment safe. And so lethal means counseling is a really important part of safety planning. We want to know what the patient has thought about and we want to know what they have access to or could gain access to. This is Texas, so we do want to ask about firearms in the home. Um, and we don't necessarily have to recommend that those be removed from the home, but we can talk with the, the teen and the parents about, you know, can we get a safe? Can you change the combination? Can you store a firearm and ammunition separately? Right? There are ways that we can kind of brainstorm some of these things. Um, and so reducing access to lethal means like the medication that the patient had talked about. Um, if they don't really have a, an idea about what they would use, uh, maybe their parents are already very vigilant about reducing access to lethal things, we can use this section of the safety plan to really talk about um, ways to reduce the likelihood of warning signs. So is that attending outpatient counseling regularly? Is that taking your medication as prescribed? Is that getting eight hours of sleep a night or reducing time on social media or whatever it may be, right? So we can think about ways to use this a little bit more creatively. And then with resources, um, in the safety plan template in this presentation, that section is free text. So you as the provider can add in resources that you like and you tend to refer to. Um, I have my preferred hotlines, some of which I discussed in that role play. Um, but outpatient resources can also be providers. So if the person already has 
you know, an outpatient therapist or a psychiatrist, we can talk about utilizing their services. Um, we can give patients um, information regarding like websites that are informative for families, um, you know, either virtual or in-person support groups for children, teens and families and discuss the role of local emergency room and urgent care as well as 911 if the patient and the family feel comfortable calling 911 in a crisis. So rather than assuming we do always want to ask, would you feel comfortable calling 911 if you needed to and kind of let them know what to expect. So those are some outpatient resources that we can talk about. Um, next slide, please. And then we really want to talk about personal strengths and reasons for wanting to live. Um, and these can look different for different people. It could be values or beliefs. Um, it could, such as their religious faith. It could be personal strengths, abilities, talents, or qualities. So our patient said, I'm nice. Uh, you know, I'm a nice person. It could be relationships like my family, my friends. Um, it could be other things like goals or dreams, right? Like I want to go to college. I want to work as a vet tech one day. You know, I want to get married and have my own family one day. These are all things that could be reasons for wanting to live. And in these sections, we really also want to encourage patients to be specific because sometimes patients will say something like, well, I myself and myself isn't really specific. So we want to make sure that we are encouraging them to think a little bit more specifically. And then next slide, please. Um, our patient that we saw the video with wasn't particularly tough, although she oh, had a hard time coming up with some ideas. And so if we're working with a tougher patient, I have just a couple of quick tips. One is ask permission. I have this. Is it OK if we talk about it together? Um, could I offer a suggestion? Right. So we're collaborative. We're asking permission. Um, and we're going to roll with the resistance. So if they're having a hard time thinking of something, validate that. It's OK that you're feeling a little stuck right now. Let's think about it together. Um, affirm them for being brave and disclosing and being very mindful that we're using terms like healthy or unhealthy instead of good or bad coping or positive or negative coping. Um, Offering ideas with neutrality. So if I throw out an idea about like, well, maybe you could try taking a walk and the person says, no, that doesn't work with me. OK, let's think about something else, because um, once again, it's not my safety plan. And then being aware of my own personal reaction and self-management skills. If I'm uncomfortable talking about suicide or working on some of these things, it's important that I'm aware of that and that I'm in, being very intentional about how I'm engaging with the patient, facial expression, body language, tone of voice, as well as the content of what I'm saying so that the patient continues to feel validated and heard. Awesome. OK, so first of all, can everyone hear me? Perfect. So we're going to kind of look at safety planning versus a no harm contract. So we've kind of dived into what a safety plan is. It's in depth. It allows the patient to kind of morph it into what they need with giving some rigid structure in there. So there's a little bit of creativity and it's personalized. Um, due to time limitations, I have a list of questions just to kind of prompt the provider to ask certain questions about, you know, warning signs. So for example, um, how will you know the safety plan? How do you know when the safety plan should be used? Or what do you experience when you start thinking about suicidal ideations or you start feeling extremely depressed? Those types of just um, questions that you can ask. And if you're interested in those, I have a whole document on this. Um, if you can put your email in the um, chat box, I'll send that to you. It's it's some really good information. Um, but again, it's looking at collaborative ideas to make the patient feel comfortable and to realize that you know this this happens. It's okay. Let me help you with it. One thing that I want to stress is physician's body language. So I want you know you you to look at are you making eye contact? Do you do that for every patient? Body language. Are you sitting down and getting on their eye level? Um, there was a study in 2011 that I absolutely love. It looks at um, physicians sitting and having um, you know eye contact with the patient versus them standing in the appointment. And it was 
the um, the amount of empathy that the patient felt when the um, provider was sitting on their eye level, sitting down with them, was astronomical. It's a really, really cool report. Or, um, sorry, my brain just. It's a, it's an interesting study. If you're interested in it, again, I can send that to you. Um, so you know, body language, eye contact, that sort of stuff is very, very important when you're when you're talking to clients and making them feel like you know this is important. I validate you and what you're saying. Um, so a no harm contract. I as an LPC, I don't agree with no harm contracts. Um, I don't feel like providers should use them. In my opinion, it's the bare minimum that anyone in the um, helping community can do. Because yes, you are acknowledging that something's there, but you're not, and you are kind of asking about coping skills, but you're not going in depth. There are no prompts in the um, in this contract. Um, you're not really asking about, okay, well, how can you make the environment safe? What other um, numbers can you call? What people can you call? Um, you know, what are your, your kind of coping skills? And also when a patient is in crisis, they can't um, enter into a quote unquote contract. So in all honesty, if you have no harm contracts, shred them. There is a lot of different um, safety plans that out there that you can use. If you're interested, we can send you a couple of them. So that way you can um, have something that you like that you can vamp into something that you think that your patient needs. So next slide. Elizabeth, I think this one's you. Okay. Um, is it effective crisis protocol? I can't see the PowerPoint, so. Oh. Sorry. While you're working on, or while you're working on pulling up, I can real quickly touch on. Um, we will get this PowerPoint sent out because there is one final video that touches on um, successful collaboration with um, caregivers. And so there's just a couple of points that uh, I wanted to touch on quickly as, you know, tips and tricks to make um, bringing a parent or a guardian in successful. So caregivers should always be informed about their child's suicidal ideation, even if the child doesn't really want them to know. Um, it's part of, you know, our duty to protect that child and obviously parents and caregivers can be a huge support and, pro and protective factor. So we always want them to be involved in the, in the conversation and we always want them to be aware of any risk of harm to their child. Um, as much as possible, though, we want to encourage the child or the adolescent to facilitate a conversation um, and we want the child or adolescent to be the one who is telling their parents about what's been going on. So rather than just um, you know, informing the parent, we really want to start a conversation. If they can't talk about these things in the room with you, they're certainly not gonna be able to talk about them when they're at home together. I would also really recommend being direct. So we don't need to sugarcoat what's been going on because parents really need to understand the seriousness um, of what's happening in order to take appropriate precautions. Um, we also want to um, share the safety plan as much as the child feels comfortable, especially the parts that require parental assistance. So like Dr. Ross Young was mentioning, you know, keeping keeping the house safe, being able being available to talk, um, taking the child places, calling 911, going to the doctor, any of those things. We want the parent or the guardian to be aware of, you know, how they may be involved in the safety plan. Um, also, we obviously we want to provide referrals. Um, but talk to the parents about this because they're most likely going to be the one providing transportation, consent, payment, all of those things. I would also really encourage getting a release of information so that all providers can be in contact. It can help ensure follow up and the most accurate up to date information. Um, and then finally, follow up. So schedule a follow up appointment or check in um, over the phone just to see how things are going with the family within the next week. We want to be sure that, um, you know, questions haven't come up with the safety plan, um, that things are still going well, that that child is safe, and the parents are successfully following through on other referrals.
Okay, Elizabeth, now we are back to effective crisis protocols in our last minutes of our presentation. Good deal, thank you. So with this, um, and again, this is kind of a, you figure out what works for your clinic um, and run with it. So for first thing is to find out if your uh, clinic has a crisis protocol and is it up to date? Have staff role play it, make sure that they're comfortable with it. For example, if you, um, if in your crisis protocol, you call the local mental health authority versus you uh, send the patient to the ER, you do that um, if, for example, if you're gonna call uh, the local crisis or the um, local mental health authority, you have somebody sitting with them. Who is sitting with them? What staff are you going to, who's gonna utilize that? Um, and then make sure you don't deviate. So if it's in your policies and procedures, that's what you do. Um, and then post it somewhere where it's easy for staff to find if, you know, if they need it. So another thing is to look at your local mental health authority and um, see what they offer as a crisis unit. Uh, due to COVID, there are some mental health authorities that have a, um, a crisis unit that it's a mobile crisis unit. They come to your clinic and once they're there, it's hands off. They take care of everything versus there are others where they want it over the phone. So I would call your local health um, authority and figure out what their protocols are and put that in your crisis protocol. Um, there are other things, so just in case, you know, information regarding if the patient needs to be hospitalized, what do they need? For example, do they need, they need their ID, they need any medications that they're on, um, they need their insurance, and also personal belongings, it's, if it's going to be a, um, you know, a seven-day stay, um, what are they allowed to bring versus what are they not allowed to bring? So, for example, shoes, can't have shoelaces. So that's going to be something and normally the hospital, the inpatient program will take care of of that, but it's something to just kind of talk to your your patient about. So it's not something that's going to be um, coming out, you know, of left field um, and then document the crisis, document what you did, document what's going on and set up a follow up. So um, have the patient or their parents call you when they're released and schedule an appointment just to say, hey, how are you doing? What can I do for you? What's going on? Um, there's also some guidelines between what um, when you're doing a safety plan. So kind of explain to your staff and explain to the patient what a safety plan is, um, who should have a safety plan. So it's it's I had um, quote unquote safety plans for people who had really, really bad anxiety. You can use that for anxiety too. You can use it for depression. Um, and then how should a safety plan be done Again, look at your body language, be empathetic, have, you know, engage with the patient, have eye contact. If they start crying or start tearing up, have some tissues, hand it to them. Um, eye contact is a huge one. Body language is a huge one. Um, a lot of my patients from, or a lot of my clients come in and they're just like, I felt like the doctor wasn't listening to me at all because, you know, they weren't making eye contact or their, their body language was just so closed be aware of your body language. Um, and then for safety planning, you know, a recap on the earlier slides, there are six steps involved. It doesn't take long to do these steps. You know, if you're going very, very quickly, two minutes. If you're going, you know, kind of slow and you're asking questions, um, you know, nine to 10 minutes. And one of the things that um, I want you to consider and a takeaway is you can do things while the patient is in the waiting room. Um, so when they're and when they're filling out their paperwork, if there's something that when they called to, for the appointment saying, hey, I've got these feelings just in case you can give them the PHQ-9. It's a little bit longer, but it's got some really good information in it. You can also give them the Beck depression inventory and the Beck anxiety inventory. That way, when they're finished with it. And again, it's short, sweet to the point. When you know you, the patient gives it to your nurse, nurse looks over it, gives it to you, you know what you're going into just in case the patient did identify anything. So that's um, my clinical pearls as Dr. Johnson would say. Awesome, well, thank you everyone so much. Um, I know that we kind of bumped up on time, so thank you for bearing with us. Um, we will get this PowerPoint um, 
sent out posted. Um, there is one additional video that we didn't have time to get to. So if you're interested in reviewing any of the videos um, and watching that final one, we will definitely get that sent out. Um, I believe that either Stephanie or Meredith will be sharing um, the information to do evaluations for CMEs. Um, but we will also oh, perfect. Oh, really quick. Thanks. I was going to say, I also in the chat placed the flyer with the QR code um, at, when we don't have the link. So if you're able to access the eval through the QR code, it is in the chat. Yes. And we will hang out for a couple of minutes if anyone has additional questions um, or if there's anything additional that we want to discuss. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and please don't hesitate to reach out to us to see Pan. Um, we continue to be available um, for questions and consultations. So I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Questions or comments from anyone? We, we are here at your service. I'm going to share this. And Stephanie just posted the link in the chat to the evaluation as well. So we Perfect. have you Thanks. covered. That's, this is much more effective than my method. <laughs>